Hello and welcome to this uh, broadcast from uh, COP26 up in Glasgow. Uh, I'm James Kelloway, I'm the Energy Intelligence Manager for National Grid ESO, and I'm joined here today with a dear friend of mine, uh, Jack Kenny from Open Climate Fix. Uh, welcome, Jack. Um, so so uh, let's just uh, introduce the topic we're going to talk about. So um, there's lots of hype in the, in the news and in the media about what artificial intelligence and machine learning is. How does that actually apply in the space of energy decarbonisation? And and Jack and his team are some of the, um, the foremost experts in that. So, um, yeah, Jack, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, uh, thank you very much, James. You're, you're too kind. Um, so, yeah, as, as James said, I'm, I'm Jack Kelly. Uh, I'm co-founder of a non-profit called Open Climate Fix, where we're laser focused on trying to use open science to mitigate climate change. Sounds very waffly. We basically focus on trying to help National Grid forecast both solar electricity generation um, and also electricity demand. And we'll come on to talk about both of those in, in a bit. Um, my, my background is in machine learning for most of the electricity system. Um, and yeah, really excited to spend the next few minutes describing some of the work that we've been doing together. Yeah, thanks, Jack. So um, let's just try. Let's just try and frame this for, for, the, for the people listening, because there's many won't have, have sort of uh, heard about this topic before. So, as you're all aware, as, as we decarbonise the electricity grid, we're seeing more and more renewables on the system, which is absolutely awesome from a climate change perspective, right? But that comes with a, an interesting challenge, which is weather. Uh, so, weather effectively controls how effective those renewables are in, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, so if it's really cloudy, um, a solar panel will be less effective than if it's really sunny. Um, and also, you know, if it's really windy, uh, to a certain extent, um, actually that's great for a wind turbine up to a point. Um, but if the wind drops away, that can actually cause a few challenges working that. So being able to accurately predict that stuff is really, really important when you're running an electricity grid with 99.999% reliability, which is what we have to do in GB to keep everyone safe and secure in their homes. <coughs> um, so, so, so with that in mind, um, let's think about how we, how you actually go about forecasting that stuff. You know, I mean, how do you do it, Jack? Do you just sort of look at the sky. Um, you know, because you hear these myths about you know AI and, and ML. Is it really just a magic box, or is there? Can you help demystify it a bit? Uh, so, so one of the dark secrets of AI is it's actually quite simple under the hood. Uh, so we're I'll, I'll use some technical language and then explain what it means. So we're, we're training a model to predict either electricity demand or power generation from solar panels or something like that. And to train this model, we give it a bunch of historical data where the system will see a, a whole bunch of examples, often hundreds of thousands of examples, where each example is at uh, 12 o'clock in 2018, there was this much wind and we got this much wind power out. And really all the machine learning model is doing under the hood is learning uh, the, to, how, how you get from wind power to power out, um, learning a mapping from wind power to power out. And, and we've done two specific bits of work. One yeah, is on okay. trying to forecast well, national electricity so demand. So as we all know, sat at home, no one's telling us when we can and can't use electricity. We can turn on our kettles whenever we want. We can charge our EVs whenever we want. And it turns out that it's really useful, as James was saying, to try and predict that national demand ahead of time. And if we have better predictions of that demand, we can do a better job of telling the generation sources uh, to come on so that they can satisfy that demand. So yeah, so we, we let the demand do whatever it wants, give or take a bit of uh, modulation, um, and then it's up to generation to match that demand. And because it takes a while for these big power generators to spin up from cold, we need to forecast demand ahead of time so that we can tell these generators what to do ahead of time. Um, and so maybe, maybe if I dive into yeah, some of the demand for forecasting for work that we've, we've done. Um, so if I quickly skip ahead and show you a graph of what we're trying to predict. So this is a graph of national electricity demand in March 2020. And each one of these curves is national electricity demand. So you can see here, 
that it peaks at maybe on this week to just shy of 25 gigawatts and at night time it goes down to what's that, 13 gigawatts and it bucks up and down during the day and our task is to try and predict the shape of this curve to try and predict what electricity demand is going to do uh, a day or two ahead um, and actually maybe we could just pause briefly to talk about what this specific graph is showing so this is showing uh, in the green sorry in the blue this is the week right after Boris Johnson announced the first national lockdown and you can see here that the blue line is considerably below the other lines showing that national demands dropped significantly on that first week after uh, our Prime Minister announced this national drop. Uh, so what you're saying here, Jack, is this is, a, this is like a normal sort of um, amount, um, and then we all had to stay at home, and then these <laughs> sort of shapes are just a bit lower? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and there was less, less industrial work and less people going into offices. It was exactly as James says, during that first week of lockdown, uh, national electricity demand was significantly lower. And so the task of the forecaster is to try and predict what demand is going to do ahead of time. Um, this is still done a lot with, with people in the loop. So there's, there's a forecasting team at National Grid ESO who look at all the data they can to try and come up with a better forecast. And I have no doubt that for the foreseeable future, there will always there will be people involved in that forecasting loop, of course, because there are always going to be times when the machines are going to miss, for example, Boris Johnson announcing a lockdown. But I don't foresee a time anytime soon that the machines are going to be able to interpret what that sort of thing means. Um, but to the ro role of the machine learning is to give those that forecasting team the best tools available to make their lives as easy as possible to forecast uh, electricity demand for the control room. And so, so we did some work, if I skip back to the uh, slide that talks about this, um, where it, in effect, we, we on average pretty much halved the error of this demand forecast using some modern machine learning techniques. And in particular, these machine learning techniques are really good at looking back at the last few days of, of demand and looking for patterns and sort of figuring out that, oh, well, yesterday demand was unusually low, so I should probably predict that tomorrow demand might continue being unusually low. And all these things that for a human forecaster are really intuitive, but um, it's surprisingly difficult to get a machine to, to learn some of these patterns or learn to interpret some of these patterns. Um, and, and to build this, we, we borrowed a bunch of techniques that have been developed from natural language processing. What's natural language processing? Natural language processing is getting a machine to understand English or any other human language. So, uh, for example, a um, digital assistant, when you ask it to set your digital timer, it's using natural language processing to be able to interpret your commands that are given as natural language. Um, and over the last few years, there's been this big breakthrough in natural language processing of building these machine learning models that can learn to associate each word in a sentence with other words in the sentence. What does that mean? So to give a, a concrete example, in, in any sentence that uses the word it, it's really important to be able to unpack what it refers to. So if I say something like, um, uh, the, the train was really packed today, it was quite unpleasant. It, the train wasn't packed there, it's lovely. Uh, then it, it comes completely intuitively to a person that that it refers to the train but it's, and this might be surprising, but it's really hard to get a machine to understand that sort of thing, to, to interpret what that it refers to. And these, what are called self-attention models are really, really good at learning from the data to learn how associated each word is with each other word. So for every pair of words, it learns to infer 
a, a weight of how relevant those words are to each other or how associated they are. And to bring this back to uh, demand forecasting, um, it turns out that when you're forecasting demand, it's, it's certainly really important to look at exactly what happened 24 hours ago and 48 hours ago and exactly a week ago. Um, but there are lots of other little nuances as well that would be really hard for a, a human programmer to hard code ahead of time. So simple rules like you should always look exactly 24 hours ago is pretty simple to program. But there are lots of much sim uh, more subtle rules that uh, can only really be learned from the data. And also there are these rules where the sort of rules of the game change over time and we don't want humans to have to be constantly updating these rules, so it's great that the machine can learn for itself. Um, so I've been waffling on a bit no, about no, demand no, no, forecasting. So, 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 I mean, this is fascinating to me, and I, and I absolutely love this technology. Um, the first time I came across it, I was like, that can't work. <laughs> and then I ran it, and it was like, this really, really does work. And then I thought, well, look, I've missed something. No, no, it really, really does work. Yeah. It, it's an awesome bit of technology, isn't it? Um, so you talk about all the rules. Does the machine find the rules from the data to a certain extent or do you, do you have to guide it? Um, uh, so so a, bit, it a bit of both? A bit of both, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, if we take wind power forecasting yeah. as an example. Um, so, as James was talking about earlier, uh, there are some challenges with wind power forecasting. Um, one of the challenges with wind power forecasting is that perhaps somewhat counterintuitively, if the wind speed gets above a certain speed, it's no longer safe to operate the wind turbine. So you have to feather the blades into the wind and put the brake on and basically turn it off so that it keeps itself safe. And this happens really, really rarely. So if you're training a wind power forecasting model just from the data, it might never see this happen. So it might learn a nice smooth curve of sort of, if you imagine sort of wind speed along this axis and wind power along here. It's kind of an S-shaped curve like this. And because it never sees what happens at really high wind speeds, it might estimate that this curve just continues flat forever. And so no matter how fast the wind speed is, the thousand meters per second, you'll still You're get... never going to fall off the end, which yeah. what you'd see from the training data. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, in, but we know that the wind turbine will turn off above a certain wind speed. So we might have to come along with a handcrafted rule that simply says, if the wind speed is above 25 meters per second, then you should probably predict zero power. So that would be like, so if you've got like the design limit of the turbine, that says, okay, 25 meters per second, let's just say notionally for a second. I know at that point, this thing's gonna cut out. And yeah. I know that cut out curve will probably look a little bit like that. Yeah. yeah. So you can just kind of say, this is what I know. This is the bit I don't know. Actually, can we infer this curve from the data? And from that, actually, get a really, really good handle of history. Exactly. Yeah. That's definitely the plan, and it, it seems to to work quite well. And there are lots of examples of having to uh, do this hybrid of hand coded rules, especially for the boundaries of the system, uh, but then letting the machine learn this nice smooth curve where there is lots of training data for it to learn a nice accurate mapping. So, so I, I find this absolutely fascinating because as, as a guy who grew up, you know, writing, writing computer software, you know, I've had many years of if then, if this, then that, yeah, yeah. So, and that was before it was a, an app or a service, <laughs> you know, um, if then else or whatever. And now what we're saying is that actually you have if then else, but actually you kind of between those spaces you let it learn and, and yeah. grow itself. Yeah, you know, that's that, that's crazy, but it's also really cool, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I, I like to think so. Yeah, definitely. I do as well. Uh, yeah, preaching to the choir here, I think. Preaching yeah. to the choir, absolutely. Um, and yeah, we, yeah, it might be worth saying that it, this definitely does all rely on you having good quality and quite a large amount of historical yes. training data. If you're trying to learn, if you're trying to predict something new where you don't have any training data, then often you'll have to rely more on the hand-crafted rules at least to start with. So I guess when we're looking at the actual prediction after the model's trained, yeah. so 
So for the purpose of everyone listening that hasn't come across before, you know, once you've trained your model, you kind of then have like a bunch of inputs and it produces an output. Is that right. about right, Jack? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so your inputs are actually really important because if you put rubbish in, you still get rubbish out. Yeah. So in, in this case, it's really important to say have really good weather data coming in if you want a really good power output yeah. out following your, your curve that you've got your model to do. You know? um, so yeah, it's, it's a really interesting way of doing stuff, isn't it? Um, I, I, I hope so, and it definitely yeah. it, it, it seems to perform quite well. So, um, well, if, I, if I just move out of the way of the slide, <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, just to give you so, so these are actually uh, real figures from the, the models that we put live in ESO. Um, so you know, well, at an hour ahead, we're at what fifty eight percent improvement. Yeah. Four hours a quarter, um, eight hours eleven percent, twenty four hours fourteen percent improvement. That translates into X number of megawatts or X number of pounds or X amount of carbon. You know, um, and that's where I see the real value of this because it's just making the system that much more solid in terms of how it can work with all this variable data, how it can work with this weather, these weather-driven renewables. Yeah, absolutely. And that gets to what our core topic is, which is how the heck do you beat climate change with this thing? Absolutely. That's how you do it. You get really good at figuring out what to get these things to do so that you don't have to use the fossil burners to kind of fill in the gap. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, it definitely seems to be the case that in order to run the grid on this variable renewable generation, you, you need to be able to predict that variable renewable generation. And, and sometimes people say, but what, what about batteries? Surely if you have an effectively infinite amount of battery storage on the system, then surely you don't need uh, prediction anymore, any forecast anymore. But I think, first of all, you'll never have an infinite amount of storage. There'll always be a finite amount of storage so you'll always need to be able to use that storage as effectively as possible. You've still got to be able to schedule when those batteries charge and discharge. And so to make those charging decisions, you'll need forecasts. Um, and we'll almost certainly need uh, to modulate demand a bit more. And, and a lot of that stuff will take time to turn on and off and we'll appreciate having sort of a, a, a good amount of warning before being um, asked to modulate so their forecast will also be really important Perfect. so 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 we've talked a lot about the, about the wind forecasting element which is um you know as you know the, you know the, the stuff that makes up electricity is a, is a combination of all sorts of fuels across the fossil range across the renewable range you know we've talked a little bit about wind um, we talk a little bit about solar i i to talk about solar <laughs> um, yeah in fact there's a slide, there's um, a slide. solar electricity forecasting um so let's have, let's have a chat about solar you know I don't know. So I, I've just done something at home. Right? I've literally just ordered a uh, five and a half kilowatt hour peak wow. solar array for the roof of my house. I'm jealous. Nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm seriously looking forward to getting it. I'm getting it installed in the middle of December, so I'm not so, <laughs> I'm not getting that much power from it initially. But then I'm just accepting that thing. Right? What are the complexities with, with forecasting what a solar thing's going to need? Um, what, what sort of challenges do we find? Uh, uh, so, unsurprisingly, one of the biggest challenges is just predicting what the clouds are going to do ahead of time in this lovely country that we find ourselves in of course it's it's pretty cloudy um, and it turns out that existing weather forecasts which are fantastic and definitely the best that we have at for example predicting wind speed 24 hours ahead of time is there's nothing better than a conventional weather forecast of predicting things like wind speed ahead of time but these, these weather forecasting models aren't, aren't super good at predicting exactly how much sunlight is going to fall on exactly each bit of the country just a few hours ahead of time. And that's for several reasons. So one is that these models take an hour or two to run. So they kind of observe the state of the world. Let's say at, at midday, they take a snapshot of the state of the world and they close their eyes for two hours whilst they're working really hard calculating and then at 2 p.m. they spit out a forecast. But because they've had their eyes closed to the state of the real world, their forecasts are, in some senses, stale or old by two hours, even as soon as they've spat out the forecast. And again, that's fine for things like temperature and wind speed, which don't change that crazily in that sort of amount of time. For clouds, clouds can change a lot in two hours. So you can literally see like the shadow going across the ground. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and if I uh, move on to this video, which will illustrate uh, the issue. So this is 
um, a video of uh, clouds moving over the UK back in June 2019. And each of the coloured circles, if you can just about see them, represents a single solar PV system, solar electricity system. Um, and this is only a tiny selection of the Ooh. systems. Yeah, this is like 600 systems, and there are about a million systems in the UK. So a tiny selection. But what we can see here is, is the colour of each circle represents how much power that solar system is, is generating at each time step. And broadly what you can see is completely unsurprising, which is when a cloud moves across the solar panel, so here's quite a cloudy day. So bluey and purple is bad. Yes. And yellow and orangey is really good. Thank you, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you can see when there's lots of clouds, uh, then the power output is quite low, and when there's a little gap in the cloud, but like here's a little gap going across, and you can see the solar panels underneath lighting up. And it looks pretty, but if you don't know about that ahead of time, that can cause havoc for the grid, because suddenly you're getting maybe a gigawatt of extra generation coming on really quickly. So solar systems are incredible in that they react very, very quickly to the sunlight. So whereas a lot of generation sources will gently ramp up, they're quite sort of leisurely about it. It just goes, no, can't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> PV just goes bang as soon as the sun comes out. Yeah. So um, being able to predict these exact movements of the cloud ahead of time will hopefully allow the electricity system operator to do their best work in terms of scheduling both the, the big fossil fuel generators and all the other things that have to happen to keep the grid stable. Yeah, and also considering you now we've got somewhere around about 13 gig plus change of solar on, on, the, on, the, on the system at the moment, that's set to increase significantly over the next yeah. decade. So the importance this will have is will come up, it's really important now, but it will actually go monstrously high in terms of importance over, over the next you know, five, five, seven years, somewhere around there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see this. I, lo I love seeing these sort of diagrams where you actually have the cloud going over and you actually see the difference and you actually see where the holes in the cloud actually change these things in near real time. Um, I predict the cloud shape ahead. It's really hard, right? Yes. It's uh, really hard. And, and that's our task. So yeah, so just yeah. to be clear, th th what we're seeing here isn't prediction. This, this is actual, right? This is actual. Uh, let's see if I can get it to play again. Um, and our task is, if you imagine pausing this video here, and then predicting the next few hours. Yeah. And you can see that it's not a simple case of just, oh, look, there's a cloud here, let's assume it keep, continues moving. Yeah. Um, as you'll see, and as we know from our own experience of the world, clouds don't just move, they also grow and shrink. So for example, here there are clouds forming as warm, moist air comes onto the coast. Um, a lot of lovely different shapes coming through, sorry, so start again. Beautiful little shapes going through here, but it sort of twists and turns and moves. Um, how do you predict that accurately? You know, that's that's a real a real challenge. And I guess conventional forecasting, no. Or, or, or to within measure. To within measure. Yeah. Uh, and, and definitely machine learning is not going to like do this perfectly. The aim of the game is just to do it better than existing forecasts mm -hmm. and well enough to help the system operator to yeah. do their job as well as possible. Yeah, because um, yeah, I mean, I mean, solar, is a, it's a really big, I mean, particularly, I say particularly during the day, obviously during the day, you know, particularly during the summer, you know, it's really important to understand what solar is doing because it's not, it's not actually a generation asset that we in the control centre can actually control. Um, it's always on. Yeah. So what we will see is, um, depending on what colour dot this is, is we, is we will see, okay, the demand required in a certain area will suddenly change. So we need to be able to predict from the weather what that's likely to be, which is why this is vitally important. And, and this is so. This is ongoing research at the moment. Uh, so, so Open Climate Fix are, are doing a, a research project with ESO at the moment, uh, where the aim of this project is to to build a, a pilot solar PV now casting system. So now casting is a bit of a weird word. It just means forecasting for the next few hours. Um, and so, yeah, this is definitely research at the moment. Um, we, we're currently exploring the use of these machine learning models that have just been published in the literature over the last few months that are fantastic at, as we were talking about earlier, associating different bits of the inputs with other bits of the inputs. So if I try and put this really, really simply, yeah. right? 
So if, I, if I've got a cloud shape coming and it recognises that cloud shape as one yeah. of your words, your it or, or yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you've got an, a dot here for a solar thing, very, so oversimplifying it, I know, and apologies, Jack. You know, it knows the likelihood that that will change because of that incoming pattern yeah. is this. That's the hope. That's the hope. That's the hope. That's the hope. No, um, I, I think we've got some real potential here. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing where this, where this is going because it will make, it'll make our jobs a lot easier. A lot easier when it comes to, to net zero, you know, um, because we don't have long, do we? We've only got we a few years. We don't have, yeah, because of course ESO's got a, a target quite soon. To yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it, so ESO's target uh, is uh, by 2025 we will run for a period. I'm hoping that period will be about an hour where we don't have carbon generation on the transmission network. That's my real hope, you know. Um, by 2035, that will be the case of sustainably. Wow. Yeah, that's what we're aiming for. Um, that's, that's kind of our moonshot target, um, but we're up for it because actually, if we do not succeed at that, it's our children and grandchildren that will directly pay the price. You yeah. know, we may even see it in our lifetimes. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a really good thing to focus the mind, isn't it? And I know certainly that's what, what drove you to go into open climate fix in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of an environmentalist in computer science's clothing. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm terrified by climate change and yeah. I like computers. So I'm trying to combine those two interests and help. Yeah. Uh, but this is very much a team effort, I should say. It's not it's definitely not just me. We've got a whole no, I mean, team. That's work. really important, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and that goes with the decarbonisation piece as well. You know, a national grid ESO, we can't do that on our own. We, we, we simply can't. You know, we need, we need help from everybody. Everyone else needs help from everyone else as well. So only collaborating together, sharing and pooling resources, sharing and pooling data where appropriate. Yeah. You know, that's how we get this stuff done. Um, is it, our view. I know that's a view you share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so, so the open and open climate yeah. fix is exactly that because we think that. Yeah. So, so we, I, I, I love our team dearly at Open Climate Fix. It's a very small team, uh, and we acknowledge that there's no. So one of the exciting but also frustrating things about machine learning and I'll get technical for a second is that there are literally an infinite number of things you could try it, it is an infinitely big playground and in this infinitely big playground there are a few little islands of things that will work and our task is to sort of move around this infinitely big playground find the islands of stuff that does kind of work and then yeah. walk around the islands to find the, the best bit of that island. This is a very strange metaphor. And there's no... That I'm there's, loving it. Just tell me you can get pirates in here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> I feel like we must be able to get pirates in there somehow. Uh, if I was feeling more awake, I could probably think about that. Um, and so, yeah, so we're definitely really passionate about trying to open this up to the whole world. So sort of publishing data and publishing all our code and publishing the models themselves to both try and get potentially thousands of people working on these problems and then proving the principle and then opening it up again so potentially sort of all the forced everyone that needs to forecast pv around the world can take this code and implement it into their own services because if we're honest with ourselves the machine learning is a tiny tiny fraction of most of these forecasting systems the real fiddly bits are integrating those systems with the 25 year old IT systems that run most of the world's grids and if we were to try and do that ourselves it would take us like the rest of our lifetimes to build it so we hope that the fastest way of achieving climate impact is to sort of get lots of people to help do the research do a, like a quick pilot. almost like get a, get a working brain yeah and then say Here's the map. This is how you can use this brain. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you want to plug into it, you plug into it. If you want to plug into it, you plug into it. Use this. Help make the world better. Exactly. That's definitely the plan. Uh, it, it, it's research at the moment, uh, yeah. but that's the plan. Okay. So, so, I, so I've got a question. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a, a novice when it comes to meteorology, but clouds aren't 2D, are they? No. How do you cope with that? <laughs> you know, because um, I, mean, I, you know, I know from my time in the sky that actually what looks like a thin wispy bit of cloud on the bottom is actually really thick when you go up through altitude. Yes. You know, how do you do that 3D bit? Because that sounds monstrous and complicated. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, sorry, Joe. Have a spot and sit on it. No, 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 no. <laughs> so this is really interesting. So, uh, there are lots of potential answers yeah, yeah. there. So, yeah. 
So the way that what are called numerical weather models. So, that, so these are the models that run at places like the Met Office on multi-million pound supercomputers that crunch equations describing the flow of energy and water and stuff around the atmosphere. And those models break the atmosphere up into this 3D grid. So you can hear, see this represented here. So for each of these cubes, it will compute some number of parameters, uh, and it will do this for maybe 70 levels uh, in the verticals up and down. And then, so, so that's this way. So you, get, so you go 70 boxes up. Yes. Yeah. And then you go round. That's a lot of boxes. Which is a, 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 a <laughs> ton of boxes. Yeah, yeah. So these numerical weather models explicitly model this 3D or 4D nature of the atmosphere. Um, for, for the work we're doing where we're using uh, satellite imagery to, as we saw earlier in that video, the clouds moving across the, the uh, solar panels. Um, unfortunately, the satellite only obviously sees uh, the top of the cloud. So it might see a cloud that's 10 kilometers up and it won't be able to see anything that's happening beneath that cloud or won't be able to see much that's happening beneath that cloud. And there can be a lot that's happening in the 10 kilometers between the cloud top and the solar panel on the Earth's surface that the satellite basically can't see. So basically you don't know, how, so if you've got your two points there, you don't really know how thick these bits are, yeah. how that solar radius will penetrate through? Yes. Yeah. So that's um, a challenge. So there, there are several ways that we're tackling that. So one is using as much data as we can get from the Earth's surface as possible. So just to unpack that a bit. So, so we're using as much real-time data from solar PV systems and from ground-based meteorolo meteorological stations measuring uh, solar irradiance. And the reason we do that is because if we can marry up that those ground-based sensors with the satellite imagery, we're getting two different views of the same thing, the same atmosphere. The satellite's awesome at showing us that there's this big dark cloud coming across the ocean, and the ground-based data is awesome at telling us, well, we've, we've seen this big dark cloud go over a few solar panels over here, and we've seen exactly how much the power generation has dropped due to this big dark cloud. So, of course, we can hopefully then infer that as that big dark cloud moves across, we'll see a similar drop. So basically, if you've got a cloud here and it's had X impact here, yeah. the likelihood of X impact occurring when you get here is pretty close. Yes. Assuming that doesn't change shape or, or whatever. Is that, is that exactly. Yeah. Um, and looking a bit further into the future, one of the really amazing things about these uh, newfangled machine learning techniques that have come out in just the last few months is, and again, I'll, I'll get technical for a second and then unpack what it means. Uh, so they don't need the inputs to be aligned in space and time, and they can deal with sparse inputs. What does that mean? So conventional models need um, all the data to be really neatly aligned in a grid in both the time and space dimensions. So for example, with these conventional numerical weather models, you, you start off with measurements which are definitely not on this nice even grid. You start off with data from MET stations which are basically just built where people live, uh, which has very little to do with having a nice even grid across the Earth's surface. So if I just translate that, that Jack, so if I live on an island here, I might have five weather stations here, yeah. but nothing in this whole bit of ocean until yep. I get to a random island here, now tell me what that blocks me. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so for these numerical weather models, which absolutely do want to be initialized, just be started with uh, a kind of estimate for what the state of the atmosphere is in each of these nice even grids. With these models, they spend a lot of time, first of all, going from this really uh, messy input data that's scattered pretty randomly across the face of the planet to try and infer what the state is in each of these regular grid points. And that takes a lot of computation and slows the whole thing down a lot. Uh, but with these new machine learning models, they don't need the data to be all neatly aligned like that at all. You can, as long as you tell it where each input is or each pixel of that picture is in time and space, it doesn't need to be neatly aligned. 
So you can take data such as weather balloon data. So I think every six hours across the globe, meteorologists fly these weather balloons, which are these huge helium filled balloons. So they want you to see on the TV, they get taller and taller and taller and yes. scale higher, and then they go pop. Exactly. And then you have to drive around the 4x4 and find where your camera went. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. So yeah, if, if you search YouTube for weather yeah. balloons, there's lots of fun videos of, of yeah. people doing this for fun, of launching cameras yeah. that don't pick you up. And yeah, meteorologists do this, I think every six hours. And so of course this weather balloon will, and, it, and it's got a sensor package on it. So it's, it's not just flying a balloon for fun. It's pulling this bundle of sensors up through the atmosphere and sending that data back so that we can get measurements, again, to James's point about the atmosphere clearly being a 3D thing, and most of our sensors are on the Earth's surface, so in order to get actual measurements from the sort of depth of the atmosphere, one way of doing that is flying these weather balloons. Um, we could conceivably use these models to take that raw weather balloon data and not have to try and interpolate that into a nice even grid, but just say, this weather balloon flew at 10 minutes past midnight and at a thousand meters up it took this reading. Um, so effectively what you're doing is you're saying, I've now got a reading from here, yeah. I've now got a reading from here, I might have one for there, exactly. I might have one for there, it may or may not pop by the time it gets to here, yeah. but it doesn't have to be, I have a reading for every single block. Exactly, right. exactly. Okay. And so hopefully this, this really opens up the power of these approaches. Because again, like James said, yeah. they're not magic, right? They're, they're not learning some, uh, it's, not, it's not like voodoo, is it? Is it it's, yeah. it's not like this black box, there's things, it glows in the dark, and yeah. robots come out and try to shoot people and then we're fine. And that's all, it's not that. It's, it's definitely not it's that. Not that. Yeah. It's definitely not that. It is quite simple under the hood. Um, but it's quite simple for you, Jack. I don't know how big I find it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, once you plug all the yeah, bits yeah. together, it becomes complicated, but yeah. each of the component bits, I mean, that's true of anything. But... <laughs> 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 Bear with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, no, you're right. It, it, it's like it's like how you wire it together. Isn't it? It's like yeah. if you understand that it's one of these, one of these, one of those, and that model can look across all those different sort of little clusters. Yeah. I'm going back to your island example. You know, you know, with the, you know, I've got an island data here, I've got an island here. What's the likelihood that in the middle something might happen? Yeah. You know, it's, that's where it's going. You know, it's just, exactly. Um, so, so yeah. So hopefully, yeah. one of the, the real the, where these models will really start to shine when we can just pull in tons of these different data sources. So weather balloons, real-time uh, solar generation data, wind speed data, uh, measurements from the humidity detectors on commercial aircraft, etc., etc. Throw this all into this big blender called a machine learning model. Um, and hopefully it will learn from historical data how all these different data sources uh, can be combined to give us a more skillful forecast for demand, electricity demand, or solar generation, or wind generation. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm, what I'm particularly excited about. Is no, and you're right to be, and I, and I just think how this sort of ties into our net zero journey because um, actually, if we're going to be running, you know, I think we've seen that at one point we're on 85 percent zero carbon. Yes, that doesn't include nuclear, which I know is quite dependent, but. You know, it's it's a it's a really big figure in terms of that. So having this predictability and yeah. having this certainty around what those assets are is absolutely critical to be able to make that sustainable, which is the twenty thirty five problem. Yeah. You know, so I am so excited about this stuff. You know, it, it can it can really deliver next. Um, it, if the research pans out. And, it, and, if and, it and pans I, out, yeah. You know, the beauty of research and, and I love it for this reason is that you never quite know the answer when you start. Yeah, yeah. You just think it really could work and I want to find out. And I, th I honestly hope, I hope and pray this is not next, Jack, because I, really, I, re I really believe it does. Uh, I, I hope so too. In 2035, isn't that long away? It takes quite no. a long time to build and test and, and not just... So, so one of the tricky things about climate change mitigation is... So, so with most tech, you have a, a, maybe a couple of mains of buckets of risk. Yeah. There's kind of research risk, which is sort of... You come up with this harebrained idea, can you build a prototype that but roughly works? Will it work? Can you build a little widget that kind of mimics what the thing will do? And it's yeah. Sort of, yeah, I think it will work. Set one. Exactly. Uh, and then there's kind of technology risk, which is can you take that proof of concept and actually build, scale it up? 
and then there's kind of market risk, which is, so you built this cool thing, it works, does anyone care? Um, but then with climate change mitigation, there's this whole other and really terrifying risk, which is even if you've done the research, the research works, you've scaled it up, so you've built this brilliantly engineered bit of tech, the users love it, is it actually going to do anything the climate notices? Uh, and and um, we won't know that until we've actually built it, which is why it's so exciting to yeah. be actually not just doing research. Research is really important, and like James, I'm really passionate about it. But actually, building a real widget. It's doing it. Isn't yeah. It? You know, one of the things I, lo I love about uh, certainly where we work in the ESO is that once we've got, say, a, a model like this that works, we can actually apply it at a national scale and apply that benefit to all the consumers and all the people that live not only in our country because you know carbon savings don't stop at the international yeah. borders yeah. so actually we can do that and we can actually share that with other people as well because it's open you know um, I absolutely love being part of that <laughs> you know even if it's just a small, a small piece you know that's really good stuff um, Jack Open Climate Fix is, a, is an awesome organisation um, when did you first decide to do it you know where, where were you in your mind when you thought hey I'm just going to reach out and I'm going to do this um, uh, so so I guess one thing I should say is definitely, so I'm, I'm a co-founder of Open A co-founder, right? yeah. okay. okay. Uh, so uh, it's definitely, a, again, a team effort. Um, but I suppose, uh, so, so I guess it was back, um, so my, my job before uh, yeah. Open Climate Fix was, was working at... What do you think when we first met? Yeah, Yeah. It was yeah. I think when I was at, at DeepMind, yeah. which is an AI company, which I absolutely loved working at. Um, I suppose one of the things that, that struck me, not, not necessarily with work at DeepMind, but projects I've done prior to that, um, is that there, there are a number of challenges in terms of getting people to collaborate together. And if you can do things really openly, um, then that makes some of those challenges a little bit easier. It doesn't, definitely doesn't completely make those challenges evaporate away. Uh, but if, if you can be really upfront about just we're going to do all this openly we don't care about sort of uh, uh, owning all of this tech that we build it's all going to be published and hopefully that slightly sort of uh, greases the, the wheels you don't want grease wheels, on the wheels skids, you? Gre grease the skids, skids wheels, yeah, yeah. Wheels. <laughs> um, um, I've got a yeah. snowboarder in my head <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got disc brakes on my mountain bike and I'm just thinking don't grease those, those don't grease those, don't grease those. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah hopefully the, 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 one of the ideas was if, if we're really explicit ahead of time about wanting to be really open with the technology then maybe that will slightly ease some of the conversations and I think it has slightly it definitely doesn't make all of the sort of business and contractual issues of evaporate away but I hope it has made it a little bit easier and definitely in terms of um, sort of attracting collaborations with academics and other researchers and also it's great as a recruiting tool because a lot of folks in the machine learning community uh, are genuinely passionate about open source um, and a lot of folks feel most comfortable being able to do their programming completely openly so it's been really great as a, to attract amazing talent. We've been extremely lucky to attract some, some really great uh, machine learning research engineers. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things I love about working with Open Climate specifically is that actually we kind of align with our purpose and ethics. So with um, National Reading SO, you know, we are very much, everything is open unless you can't. That's the starting point. Um, we are also working, we will decarbonize the system by this point, and then by that point, it will be zero carbon. That's what we have to do. So, to me, the, the ethics and the purpose really aligns. Um, plus, the cool tech could be absolutely applied to the problem and make a national difference immediately once solved. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really nice place to be in, isn't it? That's great to hear. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Jack, thank you so much for coming and joining us here at COP26. It's been um, my pleasure. Thank you very much for letting yeah. me talk about no, all this um, cool stuff. No, uh, we, could, we could talk, literally the pair of us could probably talk about this the entire evening. Um, yeah. We may yet do that, but probably not on camera. Um, <laughs> so, um, thank you all for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Jack, many thanks to you and the team at OCF. Um, and certainly a big hello from all the guys in the data science lab at 
the national good ESO because they, yeah, they, they, I know they think very highly of you and your team. So um, yeah, Likewise. it's great. Thank you very much for your time, my friend. Uh, thank you very much for letting me come and talk about the stuff that gets me done. Here's to good, here's to good COP26. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.